as we go through today's work, we're going to be sketching a lot of graphs in these kinds of situations where we're given a situation in words and we're asked to just kind of sketch what that graph would look like. I don't want to be focusing on the numbers with these. So I'm not going to be labeling these in terms of what exactly is the slope, things like that. I just want to know what is the motion of this graph going to look like. And it's going to allow us to make a few comparisons along the way as well. So simple little T graphs will be fine for this. Uh, all of these graphs are going to have our velocity, well actually no, step back. All of these are going to have time on our horizontal axis. Every single one of them is time. But the part that's going to be changing is that some of them are going to be velocity on the vertical axis, like this one will be. Some of them will be a position or a distance on the vertical axis. It really depends on the problem and what we're being asked for. But all of them will be versus time. Now because of that, we are never going to worry about a negative time, so you don't need to worry about your axis going off to the left there. All right, so sketch that first one, set up your axes, and then take a moment to read through this problem. And we see here for this one that we're looking at a car at a red light that basically is telling us that it's starting from a standstill, which is important for doing this. And then the driver floors it. So we know that at the first part of this that we're starting at <coughs> zero. Okay, so if I then start zero, is my velocity going to be going up or down? Uh, up, yeah. The question is really one of how is it going up? Is it going up at a constant rate? Is it going up slowly at first and then quickly later? Or is it going up quickly at first and then slower later? And a way to think about it is to think about what happens both at the start and kind of towards the end of our way of thinking about it. So we're looking at a car. We can kind of think about what's happening. When you first hit the gas, does it take, how long does it take you to get up to like 10 miles an hour? Is that longer or shorter than it takes to go from, like, 60 to 70? Shorter. Or let's take it even more extreme. What if this person were nuts and they uh, were driving, like, 120? So how long does it take to go from 120 to 130? 30 It takes a long time to go from 120 to 130, usually or at least longer than it does to go from 0 to 10, right? We should be between 0 and 10 pretty darn quick. And so then, that tells me that my velocity is increasing quickly at first, but less quickly as we go on. Now, it's still increasing, but it's just not increasing as quickly. And so, just to think about what we've shown here, again, we're not worrying about specific numbers, but if we were, just kind of give you context, it's like we'd be starting off with, we got up to 20 miles an hour really fast, but it took us a lot longer to get up to like 120 miles an hour. And that's why it's always increasing, because if we have this thing floored, it's always going a little bit faster as we go on, but it's not like if I keep it floored that all of a sudden it's going to start slowing down. And so that's why it then never starts going down either. Next problem, same situation, but we're graphing something different in this case. It's still versus time, but in this case I want to graph the car's distance driven. So think about what would the graph be of distance versus time for this car? All right, and so let's start kind of piecing this through here. So at first, well, of course, the distance driven starts at zero. Okay, so at the start of this, the car's not moving very quickly, right? So it's like for the first second, I haven't gone very far. So like I might say, it's like there. So then, but after two seconds, it's gone further, right? And we're going faster, so I should be gaining even more distance more quickly. So it's like my slope there has increased, so it's a little bit steeper in that second. And then after that, we're going even faster, right? And so if we're going even faster, 
that means my distance is increasing at an increasing rate. So in other words, it's gotten even steeper here. And as we go along, because we're going faster and faster, every second we can cover more ground, which means that we then end up with a graph that looks more like this, where it is getting steeper and steeper as we go along. Now, new problem. We're going to do a few different questions, a few different graphs based on this same situation. So in this situation, we have a passenger on a Ferris wheel starts at the bottom of the wheel and then rides around the circle of the wheel at a constant speed. So, the, you know, the Ferris wheel is turning constant speed. We want to start by sketching a graph of the passenger's height. And one of the things that I hope kind of jogs something in your memory is that you've probably seen a lot of Ferris wheel problems in math classes in the past, right? Uh, usually, these come up a lot in geometry and algebra 2 when doing trigonometry. Because if you're looking at the height of a Ferris wheel, or height of an object on the Ferris wheel, this one starts at the bottom, which you could either plot at zero or just above zero, because you might be saying, well, you know, he's not on the ground, he's just above the ground at the start. And then, if I'm looking at height, the height's not changing very quickly at first, because as I'm going around this wheel here, start at the bottom and start going around, I'm not going up very quickly, I'm mostly going over at the start. But then I start going up more quickly and much more up than over as we get to the side. And then it starts slowing down again towards the top. So in my graph, I'm not going up very quickly at first. Then I'm going up more quickly. And then I reach the top of the Ferris wheel. And then once I'm at the top, I start going down, not very quickly at first. But then it eventually starts getting a little bit faster as time goes on until we reach the bottom and it's not going down as fast anymore. Notice that this ends up looking basically like a sine or a cosine graph. So now for this one, I, I'm still looking at the same Ferris wheel problem, but for this one, I want to sketch a graph this time of the passenger's velocity. Now this one's a little bit trickier because velocity, remember, has a direction to it. And so we need to pick a particular direction that we're going to work with here. And so for this velocity, let's talk specifically about the velocity going up and down. Because we just looked at height. So let's think about how fast it's going up or down. So like when this thing first starts out. So again, I want to visualize my Ferris wheel over here. When I first start out and I start going around, am I going upwards very fast. Specifically, just am I going up very fast? No. So isn't this a straight line? Yeah. Alright, so at first, it's not going up very quickly as we go around it. Because going around the horn here, you know, as I'm moving around this thing at a constant rate, I'm not going up very quickly at first. But then as I get over here, at this point I'm going up pretty quick. So my height is increasing more when I'm on the side of it than when I'm at the very start. So basically, my velocity is low here, and then my velocity is increasing and going very fast here. At least the height is increasing as fast as it possibly can through here. And then by the time I get to the top, I'm not going up anymore. It ends up zeroing out again. And so that tells me that graphically speaking, it starts at zero, it goes a little bit faster, and then it gets back to a speed of zero. So that's what I end up seeing when I go from the bottom to the top. Now from the top, when I start going down, notice it's going down slowly. But then by the time I hit the side here, my height is going down fairly quickly. And then, as I get to the bottom again, I'm not going down nearly as fast. In fact, by the time I hit the bottom, I'm not going down at all. So while it's going down, that means a negative velocity. And then it goes back to zero again. This graph is also a sine or cosine graph, just like the first one was. So the next question, based off the same situation, 
Notice this one's saying to sketch a graph of the passenger's distance traveled. Notice that is different from like the position or the height. Now, if we're going at a constant speed, that means that after, well, at the start of course, I haven't gone anywhere, right? After one second, I've gone some distance. I don't know what it is. I'm going to say it's right here. After two seconds, it's gone just as far again. It's just going around the circle. And then it keeps going at the same thing. So this one ends up being just a line when we look at distance traveled. So this is another way to understand that whole distance versus displacement thing. Now we've been looking at height. Height's been this particular example of displacement that we've been using so far. Distance is the length of a path just as you travel it. So like in our Ferris wheel problem, the distance was like, how far around have you gone? And it didn't matter how many times we went around, we just kept increasing our distance as we went around. In this picture, this path that we take around the lake, that's our distance. So it doesn't matter what path you're taking, all you care about is basically like how many steps did it take you to go from point A to point B. Regardless of how far you actually traveled between them, it's a matter of how many steps did it take for you to get there. Displacement, like the height we've been looking at, that only cares about just a distance between your start and your finish. So like with height, it's ground level to where you're at, only looking up and down. In the case of our lake picture here, the displacement is just this distance across the lake because we're basically saying if I start here and finish here, the displacement is how far did I go? So displacement, it's often talked about in other terms, it's height, things like that. And now one little detail just so you know, we're talking in technical terms here because we're getting into some technical aspects of mathematics and physics. Please don't expect that all of a sudden now everybody else in the world will speak in technical terms. There will be times when you'll see people say distance when they mean displacement. And so, of course, just realize, of course, that in general usage of language, just like people use speed and velocity interchangeably, even though they're different, people will do the same thing sometimes with distance and displacement. But we aren't going to interchange them. I just want you aware of that difference, <coughs> especially as it relates to height, which is going to come up so much. Now, the last one we're going to do with this Ferris wheel is we want to sketch a graph of the passenger's speed. Now, on our wheel here, if I'm looking at speed, all I'm doing is basically saying if I am sitting in this car on the Ferris wheel, how fast am I going at this moment? It doesn't care how fast is my height increasing. It's not how fast am I going over. It's just how fast am I going. And so the speed here, it actually makes it kind of easy based on the problem we were given. Because notice it says it's rotating at a constant speed. If our speed is constant, what's our graph look like? Wow. Horizontal line. That's showing a constant speed. And so I brought up four different concepts. Two of these are probably much more intuitive for you than the other two. And it kind of depends on each individual about which one's more or less intuitive. We will continue practicing each, though, so we can hopefully get everybody there. And again, relating this idea of speed back to that picture that we were looking at earlier with the lake there. Speed is basically the walking speed. It doesn't matter which route we're taking. We just care about how many steps am I taking per minute or whatever it is. When we look at something more technical like average velocity... Average velocity is actually looking at displacement over time. So the average velocity is just end to end time. And how long did it take us to get there? So again, that difference, which could be worth putting into your notes as well, if this isn't a clear-cut idea. Now, one other little detail here. Distance is always positive. Because it's just how many steps have we taken, basically. Well... We can't have taken a negative number of steps. So that's why distance is always positive, therefore speed is also always positive. 
Velocity can be negative though because displacement can be either positive or negative because displacement always has a directional component. If you've dealt with vectors in the past, it's because velocity is basically a vector. If you aren't familiar with that, don't worry about that idea. But it just means that positives and negatives exist when we talk about velocity because, for instance, in the picture of my lake, going to the right would represent a positive displacement but if I were traveling to the left, it would represent a negative displacement. So velocity can actually consider the distance and height, or positives and negatives, whatever it is, in that particular problem. Now, the last example that we're going to walk through here is this one. We're going to do a few different questions dealing with this particular setup. The vertical face of El Capitan Yosemite National Park. It's about 3,000 feet tall. I like using this as an example. You've seen it before, mostly because El Capitan's vertical face actually is 3,000 feet tall. It's a nice, pretty number. And so it makes for a nice one to use in some of these problems. So we're looking at a stone falling from the peak. And we want to sketch a graph of the stone's height. Now, if I want to sketch the height of this, that's the height above or below what? Where's zero at? Is zero where it fell from, or is zero the ground? You'll see different questions set up in different ways. If it were saying, what's the height above the ground? Well, then it starts way up here someplace, and then it starts falling. Now, when it starts falling, it's falling very slowly, right? And so my height isn't changing very quickly at first. By the time it hits the ground, it's falling very quickly indeed, though, right? And so we end up with a graph that ends up looking like that. So have a sketch of this. I want you to have this on your paper so that you can look back at it later as we go forward. So this is height versus time of our stone. Now, I did say that it depended on how we defined height and what it was looking at. If this problem had said, sketch a graph of the stone's height from where it was dropped... Well, there it would start at zero. It would still basically do the same thing. The only difference is that it would be doing it down into negative heights instead. But the path and the speed that's going out and all that kind of stuff stays the same. But most people think of ground as zero, so let's we'll stick with that. Well, let's take a look at another graph for this one. Let's this time sketch a graph of the stone's velocity. And so again, set up your axes to be able to draw the velocity. And as you do so, remember to label it. So we're doing V versus T here. So when the stone starts falling, what's its velocity? Zero. zero. Okay, so we know that our velocity graph starts at zero. Now the hard part. Yes, this is the hard part. What's our next velocity at? Well... It ends up being <laughs> it's some number out here. I'm just going to plot it there. Because the acceleration due to gravity is constant. Basically what that means for us is that every second, <coughs> this thing is going to speed up by the same amount. Technically, it's 32 feet per second. And so then after two seconds, it goes that same amount faster. After three seconds, it goes that same amount faster we actually end up with a velocity that is linear. But notice that it is going down. Why is it going down? Because our stone is falling down. Velocity is directional, and so the negative velocity shows that it is actually moving downward. And yes, we have to account for that when dealing with velocity. And so here we want to remind ourselves how to deal with average velocity. I'm just going to do it for the one and two seconds here. So average velocity, remember, is the slope between the two points. And so if I want to do that then, then it's basically going to be delta y over delta x, right? Well, in this problem, it's not delta y and delta x. What's playing the role of y in this one? Yep, so that's going to become a delta h. And it's not talking about x here. It's talking about what? Time. T for time, yeah. So it's really delta h over delta t. 
So if I want to know what delta h is, that means I have to figure out what is the height at 1 minus the height at 2. And then on the bottom we do the delta t, which is the 1 minus the 2. Now a little side note here, you might have written it as h2 minus h1 over 2 minus 1, that's perfectly fine. All right, so then to figure out what h1 is, I'm going to plug 1 in for t up here in the original equation. When you do that, you should be getting 2,984 minus, now we do it for h2. So there we get 2,936. And of course, 1 minus 2, that's an easy one, that's negative 1. All right, so we do 2,984 minus 2,936 divided by negative 1, and what do we get? All right, and then when we do that, that gives us a negative 48 feet per second. And again, I'm not worrying about doing these other problems right now, just because we're running a little short on time. And the last thing I want to bring up, and again, I'm not going to work through this last problem, but I want to remind us, due to time, how will we figure out an answer to this problem? This one's saying, what is the velocity of the stone five seconds after it began to fall? Is this asking about the average or the instantaneous velocity? Instantaneous, yeah. And the instantaneous velocity means find the derivative. So in order to answer this one, you're going to find the derivative. So the limit is h approaches 0 of difference quotient there.